Recently, I came back from a trip taken pretty impulsively to go to Arkansas, somewhere I've honestly never really desired to go. And I say impulsively mainly because it was more of a mission than any sort of vacation. My significant other and I were on a mission to find a missing person, a friend who had gone missing and we think made it to Arkansas's mountains. We believe that he may have stopped there to recoup, to get away from things possibly. We can't really be sure. But while looking for him all that week, driving up terrifying, twisting and turning mountain roads, sleeping in the back of a car in the middle of nowhere in bear country, and hiking up steep and dangerous mountains, I realized something. I understood why he chose the mountains. So I'm from the Midwest, and all I've really known growing up has been pretty much flatlands. But I remember the first time I saw a mountain. It was only two years ago for my sister's bachelorette party where we flew to Colorado. I remember driving up to where we were staying and my sister pointing out the mountains in the distance. And honestly, I was in awe just looking at them even from so far away. I didn't wanna leave. And coming back here after looking for our friend for all that week, though I still had the same feeling of missing the mountains, I also had a new appreciation for the flatlands that I was accustomed to. To me, this is home and I've tried quite a few times to push myself to move away from the rural flatlands that I know into the cityscapes only to come crawling back. There's a peacefulness here of vastness. There's places where you can go here where you can just look out for miles and miles and see just gold, silky prairie fields blowing in the wind. You take me to live in a busy, bustling car central city and I shrivel up. Suddenly I have this itch to just drive to the middle of nowhere, just so I can get a bearing on things. It's never really a conscious thing, more of just a, God, I just need to breathe. And throughout all this pendulum swing of me, several times, moving to the city and back to the countryside, I've gotten into thinking about why I tick this way. Why do I cling to a bunch of grass like a baby needs a bottle? Why can't I just let go and stay content in the concrete jungle? Well, after doing quite a bit of research, I've come to realize that it's really not that strange at all. And it's probably a lot more healthy and normal than I ever previously thought. Biophilia. What the heck is that? Biophilia is the human tendency to interact or be closely associated with other forms of life in nature or a desire or tendency to commune with nature. This term was first coined by the Harvard naturalist Dr. Edward O. Wilson to encapsulate what he thought was the, quote, inherent inclination of humanity to center attention on life and lifelike processes, and to be drawn toward nature, to feel an affinity for it, a love, a craving. Biophilia has been talked about a lot throughout history. Aristotle, among others, presented a concept that can be simply described as the love of life. Delving into the term philia, which signifies friendship, Aristotle explored the notion of reciprocity and emphasized how friendships bring mutual benefits, particularly in terms of happiness. And we all know, I think, instinctively, that nature does have a positive effect on us. However, when it comes to research on the topic, we can really start to see how much of an effect it really has. And it's a lot. For instance, in a study conducted in Denmark, scientists utilized satellite data to evaluate individuals' exposure to green spaces from birth to the age of 10. They then compared this information with long-term data on mental health outcomes. The study included over 900,000 residents born between 1985 and 2003. The findings revealed that children residing in areas with more green space had a lower risk of developing various psychiatric disorders in adulthood, such as depression, mood disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and substance use disorders. Individuals with the least exposure to green spaces during childhood had a 55% higher risk of developing mental illnesses compared to those who had an abundant amount of green space in their upbringing. So is it just looking at a field or being immersed in nature in some way? Well, it isn't necessarily looking 
at nature. It's the feeling of connectedness that researchers say is important. And really, it's not that hard to achieve. Even just spending like two hours a week outside would greatly increase health and well-being. Really, no matter what you label it, being connected to nature appears to have positive effects on mood and mental health. In a meta-analysis led by Alison Pritchard at the University of Derby in England, it was discovered that individuals who feel a stronger connection to nature experience greater eudaimonic well-being. This type of well-being goes beyond just plain happiness and actually encompasses a sense of meaningful purpose in life. Other researchers like Zelensky and Nisbet also examined the correlation between being connected to nature and a general sense of connectedness, such as feeling in harmony with friends or the community. The study revealed that feeling connected to nature significantly predicted happiness, even when accounting for the effects of general connectedness. Zelensky notes, People who feel intertwined with nature in their self-concept tend to report a bit more happiness. While nature connectedness may not be the primary predictor of happiness, the relationship between the two is consistently strong. There's another thing that I've noticed when I'm feeling down or maybe I've isolated myself a little bit too much is that I have this tendency to go for walks. It's like suddenly I have this major need not really a desire to be out in nature if I haven't seen anyone all day. And interestingly, the research backs this up. In a survey conducted by White and his team, 359 UK residents were asked about their social connectedness and proximity to nature in the past week. Social isolation typically leads to lower subjective well-being, but the study found that individuals with low social connectedness, when surrounded by a lot of nature, reported higher levels of well-being. White suggests, some people may not necessarily want to spend time with others, but they feel connected to the natural environment, and that connection can enhance their well-being. We can see that the outdoor world can have an influence on us, but what about the indoor world? Say, for instance, architectural or interior design. Does that have an impact too? Well, yeah, it does. Just take a look at this house. What sort of feelings come up? Now look at this house. What sort of feelings come up for this one? Most would say the latter would bring more feelings of peace and calmness. This is because there are a lot of elements of natural materials. Wood, large windows to bring light in, to see the beautiful outdoors. This all reduces the stress response. Frank Lloyd Wright was definitely a pioneer in environmental design where he believed in designing in harmony with humanity and the environment, a philosophy he called organic architecture. Though Wright made some major contributions to modern architecture as we know it now, he did also express strong opinions against certain aspects of traditional architecture. He often criticized what he saw as excessive ornamentation and rigid adherence to historical styles in traditional architecture. Because he was a strong supporter of organic design, he also believed that curves and soft lines followed a more natural style. To him, this seamless connection between the built environment and the natural world was organic design in its purest form. And though I myself agree with certain aspects of this, there are some designs of Frank Lloyd Wright's that, to me, don't really evoke the same feelings of peacefulness that some historical buildings do. Some of his designs lack a certain symmetry commonly seen in older buildings, so while he does follow the biophilic design hypothesis pretty well, to our brain, symmetry is actually just as important as adding natural elements to design. In particular, the brain doesn't just like symmetry. The brain loves fractals, those mathematical shapes that are infinitely complex. In essence, a fractal is a pattern that repeats forever, and every part of the fractal, regardless of how zoomed in or zoomed out you are, it looks very similar to the whole image. A snowflake is a fractal. Trees are fractals, with branches coming out of branches. Succulents are fractals. It's been even hypothesized, with a lot of evidence to support it, that the universe is a fractal. This is a simulation of dark matter in our universe. The visible section is 10 million light years across. Even on these scales, you can find the same fractal branching patterns as in the neurons of your brain, in rivers, or in lightning. All this complexity is based on simple feedback processes and on formulas like the Mandelbrot set. Zoomed out enough, it would look like a large web. Fractals are everywhere in nature. There have been a 
a few studies done measuring physiological reactions while looking at simple modern buildings versus more traditional buildings with complex ornamentation, or in other words, fractals. The research suggests that the human eye is naturally drawn to fractal patterns, much like our ancestors relied on identifying distinct animal forms in fractal scenery for survival. And it seems that traditional architecture, with its adherence to fractal neuroaesthetic requirements, contributes directly to human well-being. Colin Ellard, a researcher at the University of Waterloo in Canada, studying the physiological impact of design notes, this introduces an additional layer of information that is otherwise challenging to obtain. When individuals are queried about their stress levels, they often downplay it. But when we assess their physiological reactions, we discover that their responses are remarkably elevated. The challenge lies in the fact that your physiological state significantly influences your health. And one consistent discovery in Ellard's research is this substantial impact of building facades on people. A complex and interesting facade tends to have a positive effect, whereas a simple and monotonous one has a negative impact. For instance, when subjects walked past the extended smoked glass front of a Whole Foods store in Lower Manhattan, their arousal and mood significantly dropped, as indicated by wristband readings and on-the-spot emotion surveys. They also hastened their pace, seemingly eager to leave the uninspiring area. Their mood notably improved upon reaching a section with restaurants and stores, where they reported feeling more lively and engaged. So it's really all tied together, isn't it? Exposure to the natural world can really help a lot of our problems. Maybe not solve all of them, but I think there's a lot of downplay on the effect that our environment has on us. We've become so accustomed to technology and advancement that we're starting to think that we're beyond our natural instincts. But at our core, we're still human and we still need the comfort from the cradle we've always known, the natural world. <laughs>